Hey, this is Blastone Mike, and today I have a very special guest. His name is John Sharp, and we'll get into that in a minute, but I want to explain why I'm talking to John Sharp. Um, this is this has happened twice with two with two very pr prominent musicians with uh, Naomi Judd and Trevor. How do you say his last name? Strand. Strand. And they both had committed suicide. You know, they, they felt like their life didn't need to go on. And that's what happened. Well, then I was, I, I go through Facebook and I'm like looking at stuff and trying to find people to interview and all that. And I come across this article. I have no clue what this article was about, but it's about Mr. John Sharp here. So that brings us to now where I wanted to interview him and hear his story because he could have been one of the statistics that we see every day of people who are very depressed in their life or they feel they don't have enough self-worth or whatever the case may be. And I wanted to hear his story. So, Mr. Sharp, how are you doing? I'm well in yourself. I'm doing great. Well, enough, I guess. Well, well, we'll get into that. But, you know, you can say you're well for now. That's good, you know. No, uh, it, it, it's like that. There's, there's, yeah. there's moments of peace and there's moments of storm, you know. Yeah. And uh, let's just, let's kind of just, I don't want to get right into what we're talking about. So I want to kind of know about you, okay? So tell me about, tell me about growing up and where you grew up. I grew up in, in Atlanta. I was born in a small town in Alabama. Well, not really born there, but I lived there. I was born mm -hmm. in Memphis, but lived in Sheffield, Alabama. Um, of note, that's the area of Muscle Shoals, Sheffield. Lots of music from Atlanta to Alabama. Yeah, 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 the, the, you know, Swampers and all that stuff. Dwayne Allman comes yeah. to yeah, world. and all the Aretha Franklin and Percy Sledge, and you know, and uh, all that shit, you know, comes from. But uh, yeah, so I grew up in Atlanta. I grew up a kind of pretty normal, average life. Mm -hmm. Took a left turn at punk rock when I was a yeah. teenager, and yeah, well, being from Atlanta, did you back since then? You know. Being from Atlanta, so you witnessed a lot of different music changing sure. from like REM to the 80s glam to even heavier yeah, music absolutely. now. Fun fact, I, I was at REM's second gig in Athens. They had a kegger at this church. <laughs> they had a kegger at a church, part, like it was a squat, but it was, <laughs> uh, you know, people lived there. Yeah. It was an old abandoned church and they played it and they had beer and uh, being a young punk rocker from Atlanta, we went up to go drink the hippies beer. And yeah, I saw their, saw their second gig. It was really weird because I saw the transition. I saw that. And then years later, I saw them play the Fox Theater. And I, I just thought that, that that was so fucking weird. They played with this band Guadalcanal Diary and Marry My Hope, I think. It was the Athens thing back in the yeah, day. Yeah. And uh, actually, you know, uh, Steve Gorman, who played in Mary My Hope, is from Kentucky. Oh, really? Yeah. And he played drums in the Black Crows and that sort of thing. But originally in Atlanta, he played in a band called Mary My Hope. But he's from Kentucky. I'm not really certain where, but. And Stuck Mojo? Stuck Mojo is from, from Atlanta. Um, Which everybody knows Rich Ward Place was Fozzie now. Or he has been for the last 15 years or more. So, yes, Doug yeah. Mojo? There's been, there's been a lot of, of music that came through. My, when I was younger, I, I was constantly either at this club called the 688 Club or um, the Metroplex. These were the fundamental 80s kind yeah. of uh, punk rock kind of. But the, it was a mix between, like, it, it one day you could see the Whalers and the next day you would see, like, you know, uh, TSOL or something, you know, so it, it, it was uh, always interesting. I, I, and I thoroughly enjoyed my childhood. That's great. And uh, I'll just let you know that uh, I did interview a punk rock legend 
and Marky Ramon in his actual hotel room. And um, I didn't really know about punk rock until I met Marky Ramon. I just thought he was just a musician, you know? And he's kind of a legend. <laughs> and, he, and he invited me into his hotel room, and there's video of it. And uh, told me he talked to me for 10 minutes and talked to me for three hours. So it was quite the interesting conversation. But um, so so you grew so you grew up in all that scene and everything. And, uh, you know, I read your post and you said, let's skip ahead a little bit, well, quite a bit. But um, I read your post and you said that you stayed in the basement because you didn't want to get your family sick. And this was during the pandemic. Everybody was watching. We're talking about the pandemic. And you stayed in the basement because you didn't want to get your family sick. And then a point is when your daughter stopped talking to you all together because she became a teenager, is what I got. Or she's but part of a teenager. She, she was already- going through a moment. Like, in, in all actuality, she was a little pissed off at me because when I went down in the basement, you know, my wife wasn't really looking after things you know she wasn't really cooking for her and things mm-hmm. like that all the stuff that i normally did i just assumed i would like i would do the grocery shopping and i mean you can remember back when it first kicked off everyone was like gotta leave the grocery sit still for x amount to spray everything yeah, yeah. robbing alcohol yeah. everybody's gonna die you touch <laughs> the top, yeah you know? and uh and and so like i would leave the uh the groceries at the bottom of the stairs and uh and, uh, you know, my wife just wasn't really inclined in the kit, uh, cooking or that kind of stuff. So she was she was pissed off that I left her up there, you know. So but, the, way, but the story is, it started with the pandemic, everybody. And I'm going to let him go ahead and tell more of the story because the story is going to blow your mind, what this man went through. And he's still here. So go ahead. I'm going to give you the floor to tell the story, okay? So I, I, you know, I, I, I came up and things were uncomfortable, you know, like I knew that like something was wrong with me, you know, because, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'd lived alone and worked alone for like six months. And um, you, you don't really think about how that shit affects you until like you go through something like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and when I came up, you know, it was awkward and uncomfortable and there was, things just weren't right with me and my missus and um and then my my daughter you know had a typical teen moment just iced me out for whatever reason you know Mm -hmm. and um and then like about three or four weeks into it I was like you know trying to talk to my wife I was like you got to help me out here you got to have my back I mean like we need to figure out I, I need to figure out how to communicate with my daughter and she just looked at me point blank and said I want a divorce and I was like, okay. After how many years? 17. And no, I've got to ask you before we go on. Do you think it was because of the pandemic or you think this was coming? I think that like, uh, I think that, that I wasn't myself. And I was, I think that uh, she had other ideas, of, you know, and. I can't really vouch for it. She, I didn't really have a, a an answer out of what as to why she wanted whatever she wanted. Mm-hmm. Of course, now she has a boyfriend in Mexico and that sort of thing. Well, okay. Well, we we'll so, move on then, sir. Go ahead with the rest of your story. <laughs> so I'm I'm thinking that while I was down there, the other things were being cultivated. You know, so. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I I went through mediation and all that stuff. Did did the divorce thing, and I just was kind of stunned and numb with the whole process. And mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, I think that like when 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 I, the the day I came home and all the stuff was taken out of the house, you know, and it was just empty. It just kind of something just kind of snapped. You know, mm-hmm. and I could tell I could tell that like, you know, that I'd taken a hit and that something wasn't right. And I, you know, and then I tried to talk to my 
my family about it and you know you know how southern people old school southern is you know like we're just kind of man up and just fake it yeah, to make yeah. kind of shit, whatever you know like but uh my mom was i told my mom what was going on in my mind and she she uh you know she just told me stop being so dramatic which is kind of like the last thing you want to hear when you're actually physically thinking of 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 ending your life. Was your what, let's talk about that for a minute. Was your mom always like that to you? Was it always like, oh, you're being a little diva type thing? I mean, or was that just something out of the blue she said? No, I just I mean, honestly, looking back on it right now, that like you know, no no parent wants to hear those words come out of their child's my even though i'm 54 years old yeah yeah mother she, i'll still be her child apparently yeah so forever that's how it works forever that's how that works but um you know like no one wants to hear their their child um say those things nobody wants to say those things because when you say those things it makes it real mm -hmm. um you, you know people have ideas and thoughts all day long mm -hmm. but when you verbalize them it kind of makes it more of a reality of what's going on. And that, that was like the hardest, hard steps in, in, in the story are expressing what's going on in your mind, mm -hmm. verbalizing it, and then actually just doing something about it. You know, that was fucking very difficult. And I looked at Trevor's situation yesterday mm -hmm. and that could have been me. There are numerous things that happened on that day when I finally melted down that, that like could have gone in any direction. Let me ask you a question. What are you saying? Now, do you think what your mom said, and you didn't say what your sister said, but you did in an article. Do you think that your mom saying that and your sister saying that maybe was a spiral to make you go out of control? Well, I, think, I, think, I think when I had my, I was, I was having a scuff with my sister. Her boy had gotten in an accident and, and uh, had a concussion. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I was locked up with anxiety. I mean, I couldn't speak to anyone. I don't know whether you've ever been uh, controlled by anxiety, but like. Uh, oh, yeah. I know what you mean. It's very difficult to to. It's like a heart attack. You're you yeah, feel like yeah, you're yeah. Like, you're just, overwhelming. You don't know. Overwhelming, and I just couldn't. I couldn't really uh, communicate with people. It was hard to to express what was going on. And I was trying to explain to my sister why I was being distant, and uh, you know, she was like, "This isn't about." about you. It's about my son, and this, that, and the other, and give me the riot act. And I was like, and I was like. I, I want to end my life. And she hung up the phone. <laughs> because she was just thinking about her son and her son had an injury and she was yeah. scared. And I understand that now, but at the time. But then you didn't. You were like, what the hell? At the time, I was like, it, 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 those were the hardest words you could ever say, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if you ever seriously thought about that kind of thing, saying those words or is very, very, very hard thing to do. And when I did and the phone hung up, yeah, there was, that was the downward spiral. And that's when, you know, I just started walking around in circles in my living room, like not really certain what to do. I'd already removed like any kind of weapon in the house. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you don't have to have a weapon to, to, to like, make a poor choice, mm. you know. But uh, somehow I, uh, I looked up a, a suicide hotline. But what and, made you? Your conscious mind made you do that? Or well, what you made know, you do time, it? A long time. I, I, had, I had pretty much a normal perception of, of like, like, what suicide was like for for you know like everyone was just you know like you the, the people that just say that's so selfish of you you know like why would you do that you know mm -hmm. you have a child this that or the other you know i had all the same perceptions of of like what most people think suicide or people that commit suicide think about mm -hmm. but in that moment that's not that none of that applies you're you're your brain like if you're really there 
and you're really thinking about it and you're not just throwing words out to like cries for help or something like that or mm -hmm. attention if you're really there and you're really contemplating ending your life um you're not thinking of of anything other than stopping the pain mm -hmm. it's, and 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 you, you it, it's impossible to think of others and i mean people always say well you know think of all the people you leave behind that's not what's that's not what that doesn't enter your mind what enters your mind is just to silence the, the noise to to just you become so exhausted I was, I was just so so fucking tired of holding in all the thoughts and all the the feelings that were going on in my head that like i mean it's like such a next level exhaustion mm -hmm. that, did you already did you already did you already get to a point you knew what you were going to use at this point um i you know i i Yes, I did, but I'd rather not say as it's okay. It's okay. As, as 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 you know, there's I I have life insurance policies and and and, and things. Of course, of course. I was just making I was just trying to assimilate you know, with what you were saying. It's difficult enough. I'll tell you I'll tell you this though. Mm -hmm. I put my affairs in order. That's great. That's good. That's great of you. My point was trying to you know show that if you're to that point where you already know what weapon you're going to use or how you're going to do it then you're just a time bomb of that quick to go off and you still let you still last it before you called you still lasted several minutes after that right i still what several you, minutes after? you still you still contemplated for a while after that before you called, you know, and you got help. I'll tell you, everything was happen happening so quickly. I mean, I, all I can say it was it was a fast moving freight train. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, like the shit that was going on in my head was quick, and 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 um, I just realized right then and there that like. A, a poor choice could become reality very quickly mm -hmm. and i told myself years ago i was like well you know like if i ever if i ever have such crazy thoughts or this that and the other then maybe maybe i, I, I what i'll do is i'll go to the doctor because it's it's obviously like a sickness like you know uh, uh you know a cancer or whatever mm -hmm. you know you go to the doctor and you're going to go take care of it and that sort of thing and i think that that shit like because i i think i convinced myself years ago about that and i think that that shit was the shit that kicked in survival instinct jumped in you know you're not well what's going on in your mind is not right mm -hmm. you need to figure something out quickly before you make a poor choice that kind of thing and that's when you looked up what number for everybody that doesn't know national suicide hotline and it's the best choice you made in your life right i you know what i i you know when 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 i heard about you know yesterday mm -hmm. i just realized that like uh yeah I it it could have gone any direction that day, and I'm grateful that it didn't. There were so many variables that could have gone this way or that way. The reality is, is that I chose to to do something about it. And I'll tell you the second thing, because I talked to that person. I don't even remember the person's name. Mm -hmm. I just sat there and cried and freaking walked in circles and just just fucking armloads of fucking shit was just falling out of my head you know and um but the, the the amazing thing is that like i after i talked with him i i i got on with this monthly script service called cerebral mm -hmm. and uh it's it's like 170 bucks or something like that a month and it's like unlimited therapy mm -hmm. and then i went to my insurance company kaiser permanente and i i i, I 
just called up customer service and I said, I've got a huge fucking problem. I need to talk to someone. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they're like, what you got going on? I was like, I just got off the phone with the hotline. I'm on fire. I can't do this. I need help. And they set up like an appointment. It's Kaiser Permanente. Mm -hmm. And they have their own little universe within their buildings and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were like, you're going to come in tomorrow at 10 o'clock and you're going to meet Dr. Jones and she will help you. And um, I went into this this office and I saw like a a guy who, a, a guy who noticed uh noticed that uh that uh that i just looked really confused and he came mm-hmm. up to me and he asked me what what i needed and this and the other and i was like well, i need to find dr jones wherever the hell that is and he took me over to like a kiosk and i um and i uh you know i signed in for my appointment paid mm-hmm. my copay and went up there and they they checked my vitals and and all that kind of stuff then i sat down i talked with her and and uh she started unraveling the mess you know and uh the way they work that is that like they have like what is what would be easy enough to refer to as like triage thing Mm -hmm. like, like when someone cries out they're gonna. They have to make sure that you're not gonna hurt yourself or hurt somebody else. Now, how long ago was that from today? Uh, I want to say that that was um, end of January. End of January. Wow, so long. What it, What had happened is just that, like you know, like when my le- wife left on the 26th of January, left everything, like it took everything, and I just kind of fucking snapped, and uh. And, uh, you know, shortly after that. But after I talked to this, this doctor, Kaiser mm-hmm. Permanente, then they set me up with another doctor that's a more permanent situation. But they, they I mean, I was completely surprised that, that, like, how ready they were. And I think it's a testament that the, the people out there really know that, like, uh, the mental health bill that's coming from the shit that people have been through with this virus and mm-hmm. all the because there's the virus and then there's all the subdivisions of, of what came from it, you know. My all the propaganda, all the, well, all the no, you got to war stuff, you got to do this, you got to do that. And, and then well, and just, that, just, a just, million just, people died today, they said. So, I mean, it's like you hear so much well, there stuff. Was that. There was that, the whole, you know, rub, the spray rubbing alcohol and everything. But, but what I'm saying is that, like, it wasn't just the virus. People, people like had various things that stemmed from the stress and anxiety of the virus, mm-hmm. and, uh, and you know, divorces. You heard about the Great Resignation, where people were changing careers, thinking that they could buy happy someplace else, and yeah. then and then they realized that you know, you know, it wasn't exactly what they thought it would be, and. People are just making a lot of poor choices right there. I almost made one myself, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, so you know, this doctor helped you, and what was your first steps to getting better? My first steps were to go downstairs to the pharmacy and take these uh, these tablets they gave me, hydroxyquine or something like that. So like a, I didn't want to take anything like I didn't want anything like Xanax. Yeah. Because I'll, I'll back up and say that she diagnosed me with PTSD from working early okay. on in the, in the pandemic and the stress of, of, of my family thing. You know, I was, I was having really bad nightmares. My wife had a chronic illness and I was having these really bad nightmares that like I brought the virus home and, you know, got her sick and she died and it, it always ended at three o'clock in the morning with my wife in a casket mm. and um that's a sign but also the just the general haze of of just numb and stunned you know and mm. um but at any rate so i got these tablets and they immediately worked they just dialed things back they're not addictive i take them when i'm 
feel like I'm losing control. Mm -hmm. And then I just, I immediately went into survival mode. I, I, uh, did you do I, any therapy at all? Did you go to oh, yeah, yeah. the cerebral thing? And, um, you know, I, I go to the, the I, well, I don't go, I do zooms like this. Yeah, zoom, with, everything zoom. <laughs> everybody does zoom now. So I do the psychiatry thing. Um, I've learned a lot about co cognitive behavioral techniques, uh, mm -hmm. behavioral therapy, like techniques to, you know, tapping and that sort of thing to help yourself calm down and settle your mind just to a certain degree. Uh, I, I have the Calm app. I do it twice a day. I, I meditate. I try and, and focus wow. on breathing and try and, yeah. I, there's, there, there are resources out there. You just have to, the hardest thing is to just make that first step. It's very difficult to save yourself when you're in that way. So your, your story for like the last two years has been low, 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 you know, like so low. And then you contemplating what you did and calling an 800 number changed your life. You're like, you're like, you know, you're learning how to do things you've never done before. And, you know, and that's the point is make sure you call somebody, call me, call, I imagine he, he would be one to talk to people. You know, I mean, whoever it is you have, talk to them and be like John, who, you know, is meditating. Hell, I never know how to meditate if I wanted to, you know? Well, you know, the thing is, is that that, that Calm app, they, they have a 30-day thing that, that teaches you how to meditate. I'm the same way. I was like, meditation, don't know what the fuck it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go check it out, man. You have to be open and willing to do anything. You have to do anything to save yourself. Anything. You, have to, you know, if someone told me to go stand on my head in the, in the corner of the room, I would do it because I was willing to try anything to change the course. Of what happens. You know? I was willing to do anything to change the course of where my mind was going. And that was a bad thing. No. Now, since you said this is into January and we're already into May, that's a lot of time since it's happened. Was it the aspect of yesterday, reading about Trevor and seeing it, it everything that made panic. you want? Did it make you want to be able to tell your story? Absolutely. I mean, what made you? What made you go? Well, when you told your story, okay. When you told your story, and I read it, how did it? How did the whole thing come about? Did you like post it somewhere? No, no, no. I, I, I had written for, for Decibel Magazine. I had a column for five, mm -hmm. six years or something like that for a long time. And, uh, and Albert's an old friend of mine. And just last night, I just started writing because, like, I'm a creative person. So mm -hmm. I'm going to write about it. I'm going to do art about it. I'm going to create music around it. And that's what I'm going to do. And, and that's how I process things. Normally, I tour. And when I tour, that ability to get out of your mind and be that separate identity on stage, mm -hmm. drugs and alcohol never did it for me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To be able to get out of my mind for a minute, I did that with music on stage and that that has not happened since january 6 of 2020 for me was my last show so i haven't had Do you tell everybody what band you're talking about do you care to well that band was primate but like i have a bunch of bands i have uh primate venomous concept i was in a band called brutal truth um i'm in a band called block up and if you're my <laughs> age, you, have, you, have a, you have a million bands because there's there's all sorts of things going on all the time people yeah of course, things happen. Someone's pregnant. You're not on the road. But this virus thing shut. Well, you know, one thing I was going to say to you, you know, after knowing you're a musician, like I just seen uh, Buck Cherry, okay? And Josh Todd's always amazing live, okay? But his voice was blown. And my son was like, well, why is that? And I'm like, because after the pandemic, 
all these bands have been on tour. They, they've just been t- hammering it because everybody had to survive. People had to survive. And it's like, you know, I don't think people give some of these bands credit because, I mean, they started right when the pandemic said you could go and do it. And some of these guys have been going balls to the wall since then. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like, yeah. are, you it's better, just, are you ready to go tour? I mean, God, you've been at home for two years almost. Well, I would give anything to, but it's also, it's also risky, like outside of the actual virus. Like, I, you know, because I'm, I'm vaccinated, I'm boosted, whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it. I, I don't get, I don't care one way or another, like what people think about that. Of you course, know, it's your everyone choice. Has make, everyone has to make their choices with that, but I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to trust it and it, it's going to protect me. And it has so far, but, um, you know, it's not necessarily that, but if, if someone tests positive, like I just had a friend of mine that bounced over to England to do a show in the middle of one of their tours, they went over there and, and the band was coming back to ju- jump back on their tour in the States and the guitar player popped positive over in the UK and he didn't get out of, he didn't get out of London for nine days. Oh my God. So he was stuck in a hotel room for nine days, man. And, you know, the thing is, is it's not financially viable to do that. You know, mm-hmm. nobody, and like, like, think about what it takes to, to sit in a hotel room for nine days in London. That's expensive as shit. Well, I was just, I was just uh, on Monday, I was at Black Label Society show. Uh, of course, uh, everybody knows Zach has canceled the last four shows because he said he lost his voice. And we're supposed to go back on the 23rd to go see him. But my point is, I was talking to Jarrett James Michael, and he was on tour with Black Label at the time in Europe. And he was telling me the story that he was calling, or his wife was telling me, and she's like, we were trying to get him back over here. We were like, we got to get him over here. The European government was like, you're going to be detained. You're going to have to figure out where you're going to go if you don't get out of the country in a certain amount of time. And she was like, it was a disaster. And then she said, then he comes home and he don't get to tour again for two years almost. You know, so, I mean, the yeah, toll and, and, that it took on people. And, and a long story short is that, like, uh, you know, we're not meant to sit still. I've been touring off and on since the late 80s. Mm-hmm. This is the longest I've sat still in my entire life. You know what I mean? I just, I this is not what I do. Mm-hmm. And there's that, but you know, like, what are you gonna do? I'm too too scared to risk the finances of touring. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you you know I'm, your hoping, story I'm, really... I'm, hoping, I'm, I'm hoping that everything becomes normalized with it. You know, and uh-huh. I'm hoping that like, I'm hoping that more people come around to vaccination. But like, if they, that's their choice, I understand they've been sold whatever kind of. Uh, thoughts they're thinking you know uh, what i was gonna say is do you hope that this story helps other people and resonates with them to help them too absolutely i just want people to know that like that that we are no different than them we may make music we may do records we may tour and stuff like that but we're still human we still have families we mm-hmm. still have divorce we have infidelity we have depression we have the darkest fucking world you can possibly imagine mm-hmm. and we're just the same you know and if you can if you can normal if you can rationalize that to a certain degree you know i, I don't know man i mean i know that like uh i know that it was important for me to to write about it Mm-hmm. it helps me process things so i started writing about it i started thinking about it and then i started thinking about like how if i actually did something with that particular piece of writing that maybe it might help someone in a particularly odd situation mm-hmm. i don't want to call it an odd situation and a heated situation maybe it's the words a human situation a very human situation man mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, I don't know, man. I just, uh, this morning when I looked at it, I, you know, cause I, I normally write 
and I do this kind of train of thought, like where I'm just free flow and it's mm -hmm. just like coming out and that sort of thing. It's just like carrying on a conversation like what we're having, only my fingers are doing it, you know? And yeah. um and uh, you know, the next day I usually clean it up, edit it, and and like try and make sense of what was coming out of my mind. And um and I was like, this might be something that that could help someone. So I uh I just sent it to my buddy Albert and I said, Albert, you can use it or lose it. Doesn't bother me. I had to write it. I'm going through some shit, you know, and this is how I'm processing it. Have you had a lot of people reach out to you? Yeah. I, you know, I was, I was, I'm not going to lie to you. I was completely nervous. I didn't look at social media all day. Because, <laughs> well, you know how it is. You yeah. Know? yeah. Like people, you know, I could have just been catching daggers all day, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I was really surprised at how many people actually picked up on it and understood and 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 uh, related. What's a human story? Like I mean, you, it's a story. Like you're, you're here to tell the story. Like you, you know nothing of my history or what I do no, and stuff no, no like thing. that. But I know you were a musician. That's about it. That's all I knew from about yeah. you. You know? Exactly, but you're picking up on the human human aspect of it, and uh, you know it's a relatable thought. You know, unfortunately, I I believe the, that the mental health bill is going to grow in 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 years to come. Mm -hmm. I worry a lot about children my daughter's age, how mm -hmm. they develop through it. I don't understand how kids that are graduating high school right now how they're going to. I mean, how do you how do you sell that everything's going to be all right, man? You know, yeah. well, you know, I, I got friends of mine whose whose kids are graduating this year, and and they're just like lost, you know, and, and uh, you know, how how do you tell them to to give a shit when it just seems like there's there's it's pointless, you know? But you have to you have to find a way of doing that, or you know, or else. Uh, it, yeah. it will eat your brain alive yeah definitely and uh uh i appreciate you you know sitting down and talking to me and uh you know i'll get this out enough as soon as I possible and i will say this Go ahead. i'll say this man i i i hope that if anyone gets to any kind of reality-based thinking in this way that they make the same choice as i did um, I would also say that, like, if you have friends and family that you really care about, when you see them, take the time to tell them how much you appreciate the time they spent with you and how much you love them and care about them, because you never know what they're going through or what you potentially could go through. And poor decisions are are in fashion right now. And 